Hey, what's up everyone? It's Invest Diva and your coach Kiana. Welcome to Diva on the Block, where we take you to the back streets of this whole blockchain, Bitcoin and crypto shenanigans to help you get a better understanding of what really is going on and how you can take advantage of it. Today, I'm super excited to have Sherry Amy. She's a near-death survivor heart transplant recipient and global speaker helping women to reclaim their personal essence and has been very active in the blockchain industry. Sherry and I actually met at the globally local blockchain fintech and AI symposium in New York. It is so good to have you on the blockchain. Sherry. Thank you so much, Kiana. I appreciate you having me. I'm, I'm really excited to dive in today. Yeah. So, Sherry, I mean, I know that you've explained this on a million times on so many different TV shows from Dr. Oz to CNBC, but I mean, what is this near-death experience? What happened to you? And uh, maybe, maybe you can tell us what you were doing. Let's hook people. Let's hook people to the yeah. end. Yeah. <laughs> what, what were you doing before this whole thing that happened? And then tell us what happened. Yeah. So I actually, um, I taught myself how to code shortly after college. Um, I did a quick little stint at AIG back in the day. Um, didn't really like at the time being on a trading floor and uh, wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with my liberal arts education. I was a history major. And, um, and I, I realized like a lot of my friends were going into either investment banking or becoming a lawyer. <laughs> and, um, so I tried the whole AIG thing for a while and I was just like, you know what, this is something like later on, if I feel like getting back into it, I could probably do. My mom was in, uh, finance as well already. So it wasn't really something that I felt like I needed to dive in at that moment. And I ended up, um, stumbling upon programming literally by accident and I fell in love with it. I had no idea that I would ever in my life become a programmer. My brother was always the one that was a computer science. He went to uh, college, literally uh, graduated as a computer science major. So that was not me. I was more of like the artist, the explorer, all of that. I mean, so um, let's, let's, point at the elephant in the room. It is very, very odd for a woman to yeah. accidentally <laughs> get into programming. Like how on earth does that even happen? Yeah. I mean, for me again, like, you know, like I said, I was more of the artist and I think when, you know, this was really early on. So late uh, 1999, early 200, when really the internet started booming and people were like, what is this thing? <laughs> and I, at the time, really just thought, well, maybe I could put my art on, you know, the computer and do graphic design. So I took a few classes just to understand how to use the software. And that's really when I stumbled upon programming. And I ended up learning a little bit. And literally, just a little was enough to hook me. And the best way I can describe it is I was somebody that always learned um, French growing up. I spent my summers up in the Laurentian Mountains of Montreal. I grew up there basically every summer. And as I got older, I became actually a camp counselor. Now, this was an all uh, French speaking camp. Hmm. And so every summer I was fluent in French. And so one of the things that I heard later on is that people that are really good at la different languages um, can actually pick up programming language very easily. And I honestly think that's what happened to me because I still, as a programmer, I felt like an artist. And I know this sounds very, very bizarre if you've never programmed before, but um, back then, you know, when we had to actually build everything from scratch, there was no WordPress you really were just doing lines of code every day. And it was almost like this secret little language that me and my developer friends knew. And you would just code like paragraphs and paragraphs and pages. And it was beautiful. I mean, the code was just beautiful. And you can tell I was pretty 
pretty big of a nerd. <laughs> right. No, I mean, the thing is, what, you, what a lot of people misconceive about art, art is that, well, there is logic to art as well. Like, you can't yeah. just go and, like, splash just random <laughs> stuff and call it art. Some people right. do it, but, but yeah. it's not real art. Like, real art has a lot of logic behind it. So it absolutely yeah. makes sense that, you know, you can fall in love with programming and you're creating something beautiful and you're be, being creative. With yes. the coding. So that definitely is the artistic side of the, uh, of the brain kicking yeah. in. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it shocked me. <laughs> so it's funny to even tell this story now because it really, I, I can't even tell you how bizarre it was that I ended up in the same field as my brother. Um, and he's still going strong in the field himself. And so um, basically, I ended up teaching myself everything. Um, got into an early startup tech company and um, really just jumped in the game, taught myself a lot more than I really actually knew at the time and just learned so fast on the job. So and, I have a question for you here, right? Because yeah. I actually went to engineering school Oh, did you? I'm not a coder. <laughs> I went, I studied six freaking years. I wasn't studying coding. I was studying engineering, but there was mm -hmm. definitely coding in our program. Mm. And I do speak three different languages, but, yeah. um, you didn't I, take it up. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, maybe it was the education system. Did you, how did you teach yourself? Is it was basically on trial and error, like doing the code and it didn't work out, you make yeah. another one? Did you read books? Did you go on the internet to learn? How do one? Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you the story. It's actually quite funny. <laughs> um, I, so like I said, I stumbled upon it and I was like, this is really cool. Like, I really like this. And I started kind of doing my art, basically in code and really started learning how to put tables together and all just the basics of like building a website. And um, I ended up getting hired, you know, like I said, it really was a booming time. So p companies and tech startups were hiring like crazy. So I just ended up looking for a job, getting hired to do that. And I honestly thought I knew how to code. And when I got there and got my first assignment, I panicked. I realized in that moment, I had no clue how to code. Okay, like different language or it wasn't that it was that it's just like any see tech is one of those interesting things where sure, you can go to school and learn about it. You can read it in a book, right? And you kind of like say, okay, I know how to do A, B, C and D. And then you get into the real world and it's like, it requires like, you have to just throw out what you learn. Yeah. And theory does not work really in the no, real world. That's, that's it, what I learned. It doesn't. And that's what happened. So I found myself in a position where I went home that night and I panicked. I literally was a wreck. And I said to myself, I have two choices. I can either go back tomorrow, tell my boss, he made a mistake. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to code. Um, or, and this was the one decision that changed the rest of my life. And that was in the midst of the panic, I drove myself to the local Barnes and Noble store. <laughs> and I went into the programming section and I pulled off every book I could find. I had no idea what languages I would actually need all I knew was like the basic HTML and even that I barely knew. And I went back the next day and I said to myself, Sherry, this is one more chance. You can back out of this and tell your boss you are not cut out for this. Cause at this point I, I felt like a fraud. I was like, I don't know how I got past the interview. Um, you know, like, did I deceive them? I mean, I felt horrible and I took a really deep breath at my desk with this stack of about 10 books. And I said, Sherry, you're meant to be here. I, I don't know why, but you're meant to be here and you're going to make it through this. And I proceeded day after day to take three books at a time, lock myself in the company bathroom for a few minutes. And I would take what I thought could be 
Now, again, I don't understand what they're asking me to build. So I had to say, if I were to build something like this, what would it actually require? Like if I were to untangle all the pieces of what they wanted me to build, what would be like the first thing I would need to create? It's almost like I had to visualize the structure underneath what they wanted me to build. So I went in the bathroom with these three books and what I would do is because I didn't know the name of the task, I couldn't go to the chapters. So I actually would sift through the index section and I would look for keywords on what I thought would be required to build just the first core foundational piece. So I'm talking like, let's say I was building the corner of something. I would look in the index and just look for the word corner. And then I would just look through and say, well, what, what's another word for corner? Or what, what else is this, this piece trying to do? And each time I would find a page in the index, it would give me more keywords. It would say, for more information, maybe you want to look to see how to build the bar, you know? And it would say this page. And I, it sounds crazy. I still, to this day, can't even believe what made me do this. But, but I mean, that's, so that's to your point. So you were saying, yeah. I don't even know how I got the job. Yeah. Majority of companies give you the job based on integrity and the ability to learn because let's face it, coding programs and languages, they're changing every single day. Yes. You cannot <laughs> hire one person and say, okay, I'm hiring you for HTML. HTML changes like a million times. Even right. like now nobody even uses, for example, I don't know, right. C++, they're using Python, whatever. Yeah. But they, they hire based on the ability to educate yourself and understanding where, where the problem is and going and finding yes. it and, and moving forward. So yes. um, I think that's why you got hired. And I think that's why you've yes. been so successful because you just yeah, don't, that's you don't take accept the feet. <laughs> you go and push yourself. Exactly. And, and it's funny because I was so young then that I honestly – you know, looking back, like you said it, it's actually a huge skill now. Now I know. And these are the kind of skills I look for when I'm hiring people. And But it's so funny because back then, I, I, I felt like a failure. <laughs> right. No, I mean, that exactly. So I can totally relate because, so for example, right now, I've written all these books on cryptocurrency, finance, da, 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 da. And I yeah. didn't even major in finance. I majored in electrical <laughs> engineering, which has nothing to do it. with anything. Yeah. And every single time, just like you did, I've been gone, I've taught myself, I've taken courses, I've, 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 I've basically had the discipline to go dive in, yeah. experience it, be the first person to actually do it and then pass on the knowledge. I know there are two different kind of directions, yeah. but I think that is what success is about is to being able to educate yourself, invest in yourself, invest the time, being yes. disciplined enough and not, not defeat, not, not, not accepting failure or not accepting defeat yes. until Absolutely. you actually get there. So, all right, Absolutely. we have to get to the juicy stuff. Yes. Everybody's yes. waiting for it. So you were doing all this stuff. So you went from zero to gigantic level of be, becoming a coder and yeah. then bam, a tra tragedy happened. What yeah. happened? So by this point, I built such a name for myself that I ended up having to uh, leave my, my business, the businesses that I had been working for, the tech companies and the advertising firms, and I launched my own tech firm, which uh, instantly at doors opening was just an absolute hit. And um, we hit success very very quickly and in the middle of that I ended up getting sick um, so that ruined my plans of um, really taking my company to its next level and this was something that was just my dream it was such a huge accomplishment I mean not only just being in tech but like you said being a female in tech and and building up such a name that I had my own company. I mean, it just was such a huge accomplishment for me. And so the devastation of getting sick and the first illness was cancer. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma um, 
for about half a year, I underwent an extremely rigorous six months of chemotherapy. Um, thank heavens, I was cancer free very quickly, still am. Um, and but something happened, and about 10 months later, I started having trouble breathing. And it basically went unnoticed for about three weeks. I had gotten checked up at the local hospital. Nobody caught it, but what was happening was I was basically experiencing sudden cardiac arrest. And so one near fatal day in 2010, um, I was rushed to the hospital by my, hu by my husband and five to 10 minutes after we walked in, I just flatlined in his arms and code blue. I mean, the whole emergency room just um, went into overdrive and it was a few minutes of CPR, no luck, and they were ready to call my time of death. And there was one man in that emergency room, uh, one doctor that refused to give up on saving my life. And he ordered everybody in that emergency room like a drill sergeant to continue with chest compressions and CPR. And they ended up doing that for over 90 minutes. And so they, you, were, you were basically yeah. considered dead yes. for 90 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they, even after 90 minutes, they never got my heart to restart. So it is it, like, it's, I get goosebumps, but it, it's surreal that I'm still sitting here to this. So day. I know that this takes us to the next level of spirituality, but mm -hmm. during that 90 minutes, mm -hmm. you actually experience death. You, and yeah. you, and you number. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. I remember the moment I crossed over. I mean, literally the first thing I said was, wow, that was so easy. And the reason I said that was because despite the amount of success I had already always achieved in my life, there was still a part of me that was always terrified. It's very hard to explain because on the outside, I was very successful. But to be honest, I was still very hidden. I was still filled with, filled with a lot of shame and guilt. And I didn't even know where it came from. I just had a lot of, um, you know, looking back, it just trauma, I guess. And, um, you know, you're just kind of taught to just suck it up in life and to keep going. And so it wasn't something I really thought about. It was just how you live life. You just put on your outfit, you go to work, you make money and, you know, you do all the right things. You check all the check boxes, you get married. Um, and I had literally just gotten married right before I flatlined. So, you know, all this happened you know, within months of, of getting married. So when I said that was easy, it was because I realized in that moment of crossing over how much of the fear that I had been carrying on my whole life underneath the surface had to do with just the fear of living and, and being alive and, and the fear of what happens when we die. And, and is that it? You know, I didn't realize until I crossed over how much of a burden that one fear that so many of us have about death actually suppresses us our entire life. And it wasn't until that moment that I crossed over that I realized what a waste of energy because number one, it was so easy to cross over. Even in the midst of 
the trauma of the emergency room. My soul easily crossed over. And then beyond that, I was surrounded by so much love. I, I wasn't alone. I was immediately greeted. I wasn't alone. I felt connected to everybody, everything, all of life. And the first thing that then came to my mind after that was, I'm going to be okay. And so is my family. So this is obviously very impactful like crazy. Mm. And I can assume that some people might just think that you thought, thought it or imagined it. And I'm not going to get there. I want to talk, I want to tap into something, a keyword that you just mentioned. And that was fear. And that was something that was holding you back from actually enjoying all the successes that you're having in your real life. Yeah. And so my question to you, the reason why I'm asking you this is because actually last week I asked all of my uh, people, tribe, the subscribers, what is your greatest fear? Because I believe until you actually admit that you are fearful of something, you're not going to be able actually to tackle it and confront it. So my question to you is, did you know that you even had that fear? Yes. I this? Yes, I definitely knew that I was absolutely 100% terrified of death. I didn't understand it. I, it was not talked about at all in my house. So what do you do as a little kid and then you're growing into an adult and you literally have no framework for... Something that's going to happen to everybody. Right? <laughs> you're not going to get out of here alive. No one is. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the thought of that now, it, it, it's, it's shocking. So how does this experience change you? So you went, you crossed over, you saw how easy it was. Mm -hmm. And we know that in the real life, there was a doctor who was working on you. Mm -hmm. But I know that it was also you who decided to kind of go back. Is that correct? Yeah, because one of the things that I experienced, which is also, um, and just to back up a bit, the near-death experience is actually, um, it, it was actually coined that by a medical researcher. So there actually is like this medical uh, diagnosis of what a near-death uh, experience is. And so uh, there are certain criteria they look for when somebody shares their story. And you'll notice that if it's classified as a near-death experience, a lot of the core uh, factors are similar. So one of them may be, you know, we saw the light. You know, you're always asked, did you see the light? Yes, we saw the light. Um, but you'll Where also is have... the light? Is it like... <laughs> um, it's different for different people. For me, it was actually, it was almost as if I was being blinded by the sun. And it was, it was so warm. It was like this golden, warm, beautiful, welcoming, bright light. But it was so bright that it was like hard to look at. But it wasn't scary. It was just like, it was just like this light from home. I mean, um, that's the only way I can describe it. And, and then when you say you cross over, you cross over mm -hmm. what? Is it like a line or... Um, it, it was kind of like if you were to just snap your fingers, like one of those like old TV shows where it's just like, oh, like, I, like genie, yeah. <laughs> what, what was it? like, um, uh, you know, the, the genie that would just like kind of, you know, flicker her eyes or snap her hands and she would just be in, in a different scene. That's what it was like for me. So it was more like, I learned that there was no like veil between the physical world and where I went. It's like, I was just right here. You just can't see me with like your physical eyes. So it, it was almost like just walking through a door. But you were still, you could see, could you see the emergency room? Could you see your husband? Well, it was multidimensional from what I'm understanding, right? Like everything yes. was... Yes, it was it, for me when I first crossed over. It wasn't multidimensional. I was definitely in one 
other realm. Uh, you know, it was very calm. It was very quiet. It was surrounded by white. I was then greeted by these beings. Um, and it was the beings that took me on this whirlwind where all of a sudden like time and space just collapse. And that's when I experienced um, a life review. And so that's more where you experience different dimensions, different timelines, um, different, you know, you know, maybe one lifetime I was in India, you know, what another, I was in Japan and you kind of just live them all out. Um, and it sounds exhausting. And it was like, for me, this went on forever. Um, for me, it felt like years. So what actually ended up being a week in our time here in the physical felt like years. Like oh, wait, so it wasn't just years. a 90 minutes. It was actually a week that you were out. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, just the, we would be here all night if I talked about the actual trauma. Right. Piece, right, but right. Yeah. It, um, uh, yeah, they never got my heart to restart. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this, I was in very bad shape. I definitely, um, really almost did not make it. So, um, I, I, and like, this is so fascinating. I want to dive more into it, but we also have the time here yeah. I know that you have to go and I know I have to go. I want to, I want to know. So what made you to, like, was there any, some sort of a core issue throughout your lifetimes that made you want to come back? How did this experience change you? And then I'm going to get into what you're doing right now and why. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely one simple reason why I came back. And, um, and first, I, do, I did forget to mention that when I first crossed over, I said, I'm not going back. <laughs> I was just, I, I was filled with so much bliss. And like I said, I knew I was okay. I knew my family was going to be okay. I didn't want to leave. It was, it was more love than I had ever experienced. Just that unconditional, like, no burdens, you know it, you would almost have to be crazy to leave that. So it wasn't until after the, the lifetime reviews that I made one simple decision. And that was to, I changed my mind and that I wanted to go back. And that's because throughout the lifetime reviews, I learned that why certain things that happened to me in life, I learned why I had gotten sick. I learned why, um, my life had played out the way it had, right? So we all each come here, we have our own unique issues, right? You know, what happened to me or what, what my soul or what I'm as Sherry is meant to experience in life is very different from you, for example, right? So I was shown what I needed to show to free my soul from all of this stuff that was really just dragging me down from owning who I am, you know, in this world and beyond, you know, I mean, this is getting very metaphysical, but that's really what I experienced. And the reason I share this story is more for obviously, because we're, we're alive here but the impact was that I came back no longer fearing death, understanding how powerful each of us all really are, and on a mission to clear away all of the trauma, all of the fear, all of the junk. It's like it, I use the word junk and gunk. Because when you come back from the afterlife, that's what it feels like. It's like, ew, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing myself to somebody else. Like that energy feels icky after you, you have just had your soul stripped of all of that. So when you come back into the physical, this world can feel very dense, right? I mean, we all feel that every single day. Um, but imagine having that stripped away from you and then having to come back into it as an adult. Um, 
it, it can be a bit of a, sh a culture shock, you know. And so it took me several years to kind of reemerge, like out of my little cocoon and, and really come back in the world. And it's only actually been four years for me, but I use those four years to say, I'm still alive by some miracle. I, I don't even know, I'm healthy, but I have no idea after what I just experienced, how long any of us have on this planet. And what I witnessed, what I saw, it doesn't matter whether or not anybody believes it, it was something I had to see to free my soul. That is such a key, key keyword here because I really didn't want people to get distracted because I know the people who are going to watch this, everybody's going to have opinion. <laughs> but that is not the main takeaway. And yeah. your experience may be different than another person who had a near-death experience. And yeah. that should not really distract people from what really the takeaway here is. And that is you are creating all this crit all these problems for you because of the fears that you have that are unresolved and whatever this experience that was it really helps you get rid of those fears get a heart transplant for god's sake and now be healthy with us today and empowering women being at the top of the tech and being in the blockchain technology which is the next topic i really want to yeah. get into why your story is so fascinating that i really wanted to be our audience to hear about it. So tell us about what happened next. What, what are you doing now? Why are you doing it? And what does the future hold for you? Besides the fact that you obviously know that you don't, <laughs> any, any minute anyone, any of us can go. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically I've spent the last four years, you know, a combination of rehabilitating my body um, now that I have a healthy new heart, but at the same time, really just getting out there and and stepping into a new form of leadership that I had never done before. I had managed people before, but I was never in the spotlight. I was never with cameras in front of me, on stage, sitting next to Megyn Kelly or Dr. Oz with the world, wondering, what is she gonna say, <laughs> you know? And that does something to you. It teaches you something about yourself and about the power of one person's voice to influence millions of others. And one of the reasons why I love blockchain is it reminds me of back when I first started coding and it was new and it was innovative and everyone's like, what's this internet thing? And now it's like, what's this blockchain thing? You know, most people don't even really understand what's going on. And to me, it's, it's, it's a powerful movement. You know, it's, it's not even so much about what is the end game. It's a pivotal moment in humanity, in, um, in the world that can finally allow you know, greater access to financial resources, to developing countries. I mean, how long has that had to take? You know, these are, these are pivotal, um, pivotal technologies that are going to change the landscape of the world as we know it. Um, there's so much accountability and responsibility that has just been lost over the years. And we have you know, obviously finance and banking has, has changed the game for so many of us for generations, but all of a sudden we're hitting a point where it's gotten so big and there's such a lack of accountability and, and the world has become more international. And um, so processes and uh, structures need to be revisited and rebuilt to actually handle this new digital explosion that is coming into the world. And for somebody like me that has now become comfortable in being a voice, not just for myself, right? I'm a voice for myself first. I want to be clear about that, right? Because you do this for yourself and in, as a result, you impact others. That's how I say, that's how I see leadership. 
It's not about ordering people around or getting into the spotlight so you can make it all about you. It's about growing yourself. It's about growing your soul and seeing how much of an impact, how much good you can do in the world. So um, I jumped in very quickly into uh, supply chain logistics. I was director of communications for a blockchain startup. We raised 30 million very, very quickly last year. Um, and I recently started working um, now with uh, the FinTech Connector, which is really connecting um, financial and uh, uh, technical services all around the world. Um, we've got a private platform, exclusive high caliber um, startup innovators, investors that are changing the game and understand that this is just the beginning of fintech out in the world and as you know fintech can you know involve blockchain ai cybersecurity so for me i'm actually loving being able to be in fintech because the amount of people i've connected with from around the world the projects i've been able to support even uh, projects that are supporting women developers all the way in ethiopia I mean, the game is changing, and it's an honor for me to, after everything I have been through, to be standing here back again, but here, a role model for so many women that know that they belong in this space, but maybe a little intimidated because, it, yeah, you know, it is uh, still very highly uh, male dominated. You know what but, I love the most about this group mm -hmm. is that there are some women in the group. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's so weird. It's so upsetting to be, to say that, but it is yeah. obviously it's getting there. And I, I'm yes. seeing more women really than ever in blockchain technology than any other yes. male dominated field before it, which is very, yes. very inspiring. And I think we have to thank people like you who have been an advocate for women in the field and um, who've been really leading and inspiring women to get into the field. So uh, we're, I'm really appreciative for all the help that you've been doing. And I think uh, it's, it's very interesting that you were scared of the spotlight. You didn't want to be in the spotlight, but after your experience, you just fi yeah. figured that this is what you got to do. And by being in the spotlight, you've been able to help so many other people and yeah really getting the word going about the blockchain technology, which I do also agree with you. I think it's a pivotal a technology that everybody needs to learn about. That's why we're doing the Diva on the block. And um, I think your story is so fascinating. I don't want to get into the tech stuff today because I want the main takeaway of this conversation today, the inspiration and being able to tackle your fear Mm -hmm. identifying it and letting it go and just throwing yourself at it no matter if, whether if you think you're a fraud and you're, you're like oh yeah. my god I don't know what I'm doing just throw yourself at it go for it and you're gonna you're gonna make it if, you, if you're actually disciplined and you actually believe in yourself so um yes. Sherry thank you so much for being us today mm -hmm. I am going to ask you one final question this is a little bit more cryptocurrency related and uh do you also, are you active at all in the cryptocurrency field or are you focused mainly on the blockchain side of it? Uh, I mean, one kind of comes with the other. So, I mean, I, it's not like um, I'm not in it. I'm not a day trader. So, um, I do have obviously my own um, cryptocurrency. I, uh -huh. I, That's I my love question. It. What's okay, your favorite yeah. cryptocurrency? Not day trading. Oh, God. <laughs> Um, you know, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me that. Um, and I don't even know if I've ever thought about that because I, I'm, I'm like, I'm not exciting at all when it comes to my crypto. I literally just, I'm one of those, I need a nice balanced portfolio. <laughs> we like that. That's what I do. No reason yeah, okay. to be okay. afraid of that. That's exactly okay. what we do. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> So you have Bitcoin yeah. probably have accumulated yeah. a little bit of a Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum, yeah. um, Litecoin. Yeah, I've got, I've got lots. Um, I'm really loving. I got to meet the team um, of Cardano. 
I love what they're doing. Um, got to hang out with Charles Hoskinson and his whole executive team. I really, really love what they're doing. So I do want to give them a shout out. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I love it. it. It's great. And um, I, I always feel like sometimes I'm, I'm just like the level-headed one in cryptocurrency. No, we need you people know? like you because unfortunately <laughs> what's happening right now is like, the hot-headed people versus people who are calling it a scam. And yes. we need more people in the middle ground that, hey, this is actually happening. This is real. Yeah. And, 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 and really educate people to how to not get into the severe like re left or right and get involved in a yes. mature way so that you don't Absolutely. fall behind. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I just, I love your show. I just have to say that before we go, I love your show. I love what you're doing in the space. It is fantastic. So I am so honored that you invited me on here today. Thank you so much. Of course, it's an honor for us to have you and thank you viewers at home. I hope you enjoyed having Sherry. Oh my God. On Diva on the Block. And we will see you again in the Neva, next Diva on the Block. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was great. Thank you so much. I think, I mean, oh my God, your story is just so fascinating. Um, and I, I have to just go read about it because I know if I find <laughs> you, it's going to be like hours and hours of like not right. talking. But I'm right. happy that we got into the core me uh, too. takeaways from it. Yes, me too. Thank you so much for this. And I actually, really Michael was mentioning you used to live in Westport. Yes. I live in Westport. I'm in Westport right now. Are you? Are? Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, so we're actually trying to do, you know what, how we did um, with the AI symposium, the women's yes, panel? Yes. Mm -hmm. So University of Fairfield want to do something similar to that in February and I've been trying to put together the panel. So oh, knowing yeah. that you've, built, you've lived in Westport. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm not that far away. So yeah, if you've got something lined up absolutely yeah. yeah I would love to be a part of that awesome awesome and we'll get to talk more about the women issues on that one because that one is yeah. more specific towards women and okay right. and I know Perfect. you have yeah. been through a lot yeah. being a woman of color I mean right? Right? just that alone oh my gosh you are a double target for everything